We're getting into the um, last kind of section of the book of Ezekiel that we were, I've been, I've been excited to get to this point, all right? So uh, we're getting into the last section, and we're going to try and do five chapters. We know we can do it because we did eight last time, so there should be a breeze, right? So we'll slow down a little bit and, uh, and look at some of these things. We're starting in chapter 33 tonight, and uh, so we're going to be looking at several themes that you'll be familiar with, that you've heard of before, and uh, we'll be looking at those uh, in 33 through 37 tonight. So looking in chapter 33, you might have a header, a chapter heading there. What chapter heading do you guys have? The Watchman? Yes. Uh, so we have this, this concept of the Watchman in chapter 33. Uh, and so we have the duties of the watchman. As you look at this, this passage, uh, the Lord speaks to, to Ezekiel, son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them. Uh, and so he begins talking about the, this idea of the watchman. What is the watchman to do? What is, what is the watchman? Just, uh, stand guard, he watches. According to the text, what does he do? Do he have like an end glow watch and just hell, like telling everybody the time? Or like, what, is, what does he do? He warns the people. So if he warns the people and the people do not listen, what does God say? The, yeah, so the, the sins are upon or the blood is upon that individual, right? Uh, now, if he sees danger approaching, does not warn anybody, what does he say? What will happen? It's on the watchman. But what's interesting, um, in verse 6, he says, uh, the person is still taken away in his iniquity, right? The person is still guilty. Okay, the person is not without excuse. Uh, it's just that the watchmen themselves are now, they have that blood upon their head. Uh, and so what's interesting here is that he does not say, well, they're, they're scot-free because you didn't warn them. No, that's not what he's saying. He said they're still, they still are going to be taken away in their iniquity uh, because of the sin. So this is not a situation where, um, you know, the, the watchman is guilty. I look over in Acts chapter 20. I want to see something real quick. Uh, Acts chapter 20. Why are we going to Acts, you say? We're going to Acts because Paul uses this concept uh, in, in his teaching. Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27. <clears throat> Acts 20, 26 and 27. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God or the whole counsel of God, as some translations have written there. So, uh, what is Paul saying by, by quoting that concept, by quoting that idea? What is he, how do you think he considers himself? What do you think he considers himself to be? A watchman. Uh, so he has a message from God. He has a warning from God that that message needs to be preached. Uh, and uh, has that changed for us at all? We still have the same message, right? We still have the same thing we need to be teaching. We need to get that out there. So that watchman concept... Um, Paul kind of says that he's, he's holding himself to that, that ideal, and he said he's free from the blood of all men because he's not held that back. Now, in verses, uh, beginning of verse 7, um, God calls uh, Ezekiel out as a watchman, right? So Ezekiel is now this watchman. Now, as for you, son of man, um, he says, I appointed you a watchman over the house of Israel. And so that's what we see him doing, obviously, throughout this book, throughout this letter. Are, uh, we see him doing that, uh, being a watchman and talking to his people. And he kind of reiterates to them, you know, what he just said. He just puts Ezekiel's name in there, saying it's, it's, it's your, it'll be you if you don't tell them what's going on. Which, he's had some hard things to say, right? His messages have not been like, you know, roses and gumdrops and that kind of stuff. It's been some hard stuff that he's had to convey to them. And as far as we know, he's been faithful in conveying that information. Uh, and so he begins talking about, all right, now look in verse 11. Uh, he says, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. If you want to write out here at chapter 18, verse 23 uh, and 32, we've seen this before. God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Um, but he says here, rather, that the wicked turn from his way, turn back, turn back from your evil ways, why then will you die, O house of Israel? Uh, there's some, in, in my text, there's some exclamation points here. What is God, with all this message of Ezekiel, what is God wanting his people to do? Turn back. Turn back. Uh, he's seeing this precipice before them, and he's saying, turn around, turn back, 
Come back to me. He's yelling out to them. Uh, and he says, he says here, And you, son of man, say to your fellow citizens, The righteousness of a righteous man will not deliver him in the day of his transgression. And as for the wickedness of the wicked, he will not stumble because of it in the day when he turns from his wickedness. Whereas a righteous man will not be able to live by his righteousness on the day that he commits sin. Um, verse 13 is, if this seems kind of weird, verse 13 is kind of the, uh, the keystone for this. When I say to the righteous, he will surely live, and so he trusts in his righteousness and he commits, that he commits iniquity, none of the righteous deeds will be remembered. Um, what, what is he getting at here with the righteous deeds and the righteous being uh, on their own, but the wicked one will, will, will turn back? What is he trying to say here? Any ideas of what he's trying to say? Yeah, so your own, own understanding, what is it you're saying? Yes, I can. I kind of uh, did a preamble to our class in our um, little kind of discussion before services uh, in that you can't, on your own righteousness, on your own merit, you cannot be righteous before God. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many dragons you slay. It doesn't matter anything that you do. You cannot be righteous by yourself on your own merit, and you cannot trust in your own righteousness. However, the wicked person that turns and repents and turns back to God, they're the ones that are saying, you're going to be able to have a relationship with God, with God because you've turned back. Um, and so it's that iniquity that separates us. Uh, and again, if you want to write it here, Romans 10, 1 through 3, that's exactly what Israel was doing, was setting up their own system of righteousness and not submitting to the righteousness of God. That was the issue and continued to be an issue. Uh, and so they have not submitted to that. Um, and so this is when he says to the wicked, when I say to the wicked, you will surely die. And he turns and practices justice and righteousness. Um, if a wicked man restores a pledge, pays back what he has taken by robbery, walks by the statutes which are ensure life. Does this remind you of anything? Does, does Jesus ever talk to anybody in the New Testament and confront them about their sin? And they say, you know what, I'm going to pay back tenfold what, or twofold whatever uh, has, I've robbed, if I've robbed anybody or wronged anybody. Does that ring a bell? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was one that showed true righteousness, right, and repented. He was a sinner, but he repented and turned back. Um, and what's, well, we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. But um, anyway, so this is, this is uh, an, a very interesting concept. Why does he say your fellow citizens to, he says it twice in this chapter, your fellow citizens. Who is he, who is he, who is he dealing with? He's dealing with the Jews, right? Where is Ezekiel right now? Is he in his homeland? He's in captivity, right? Uh, and so a lot of this message that Ezekiel's saying right now are to those who are in captive, in captivity. So we're not dealing with people who are gone into captivity, and we'll see later on uh, kind of where they are right now. Um, and so uh, he's, he's talking to these people in captivity, saying all these things happened because... Well, we'll get to it in just a second. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I said I've, I've, been, I've been excited to get to this point, so um, I'm, I'm getting too excited. And 21 through 29, Jerusalem falls. Uh, you, there's a date here. Now and then the 12th year of our, of our exile in the 5th month, the 10th month, or the 5th of the 10th month. This is January 8th, 585. January 8th, 585, if you want to write that date out there. Uh, about 2.30 in the afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, so... What, what is important, so here is the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, what we need to know historically at this point is that this, is, this fall, so there were several sieges of Jerusalem. There was a siege in 605 B.C. when a lot of the young princes and those kind of people were taken into captivity. Ezekiel may have been taken into captivity then. Then there was another siege in 597 B.C. Uh, when 10,000 people were taken into captivity. If he wasn't taken in the first one, he was taken into the second one, okay? And now here in this one, in 586 uh, B.C., uh, we see here is the actual fall of Jerusalem. The, the temple's destroyed, the walls are torn down, everything is kind of like raised to the ground. Uh, and, and so message, a message comes. Uh, and so in verse 22, Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me in the evening before the refugees came, and he opened my mouth at that time, to, uh, came to me in the morning, so my mouth was opened, 
and I was no longer speechless. If you want to write out there uh, Ezekiel 3, 26 and 27, if you remember, Ezekiel could not talk unless God told him what to say. So he could not go to a drive through window and order a hamburger because he couldn't say anything, right? Uh, this is uh, Ezekiel 3, 26 and 27, were the passages where he said, so he only spoke when God told him to say something. Um, and obviously he wasn't ordering hamburgers, he didn't have hamburgers then. Anyway, sorry. Okay, so the word of the Lord came to him, verse 20, Son of man, they, do, they who live in the waste places in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one, yet he possessed the land. And so to us who are many, the land has been given as a possession. So there was a siege, the city was destroyed, most people were taken off into captivity, there were still remnants of people that were hiding in the nooks and crannies and had gone out and that kind of stuff. And they're saying what? According to this passage, what are they saying? About everybody's taken away, and they're saying what? They're singing Father Abraham's song, right? No, so they're, singing, they're saying that now everybody's gone, God has given us this land, and so we can, we can make it our land, right? We've, we're going to possess it. We're going to take care of it. And even though Abraham started with one, and there's, there's more than one of us here now, and we're, we're going to do what we can to take care of this land. Uh, God said, wrong, oh, Mr. Consumer, right? That is not what's about to happen. Uh, and so he begins to say to them, he says, thus the Lord, the Lord of God, you eat meat with the blood in, on it. Lift up your eyes to your idols as you shed blood. Should you then possess this land? They're saying, you're, you're a bloody people. You've been, you've been contrary to me. Why would you possess this land? Why would you possess it? You rely on your own sword. You commit abominations. Each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Should you possess this land? Thus you say to them, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely those who are in waste places will fall, fall by the sword, and whoever's in open field will give uh, to the beast to be devoured, and those who are in the strongholds and in the caves will die of pestilence. Again, he goes back to his three things, right? Sword, uh, wild beasts and pestilence are going to wipe out anybody who's left over. So God is saying nobody will get this. Nobody will get this land. Uh, and later on he even says the land is going to be fallow. It's going to rest for a while because of all the atrocities that you've done in it. Um, and verse 29 again, uh, then they will know that I am the Lord when I make a land a desolation. Uh, and so uh, again, though, that's what he's trying to get them to learn through all of this. Then they will know that I am the Lord. This is the last section here, uh, verses 30 through 33, uh, those that listen to Ezekiel. And this is interesting. Uh, I'm going to read this section just because it's, it's rather interesting. But as for you, O son of man, you are fellow citizens who walk about you by the walls and in the doorways of the houses. Speak to one another, each to his brother, saying, Come now and hear what the message is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as a people come. And they sit before you as my people and hear your words, but they do not do them, for they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their gain. Behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a, a beautiful voice and plays well on the instrument, for they hear my words, but they do not practice them. So when it comes to pass, as surely it will, then they will know that a prophet had been in their midst. What is he saying about the people who are in captivity with him? Are they pure and righteous and on the up and up? No. Are they wanting to listen to him? Yeah. Hey, let's go listen to him. You know, he's, uh, but he's saying that they're talking like they're listening to you because you're one that just sounds nice. Like you just, you're saying the things they want to hear, right? You're, you're saying what they want to hear. They're entertaining. Uh, one individual said sensuality uh, hears and does nothing, spirituality hears and obeys. There's nobody today that says, well, I didn't really particularly like that message today. Um, you know, he could have done this or said this differently. Or there are people today that say, oh, I just really like that message, and they come on Sunday and just, man, that's awesome, and they, we leave, we leave, and it's like we never heard it. Right. Did Jesus say anything about this at all? He did a little bit, right? Now, what, what is interesting is that you're going to hear common, so you're reading through Ezekiel, like I know you're doing your homework, and I know you're reading through Ezekiel. And as you're reading through Ezekiel, you're hearing things like, wait a second, I've heard that in the New Testament. I've heard that in the Gospels. 
it's because Christ was calling people back. And we'll get to that in just a second. I'm, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so uh, Christ was calling people back. So let's go to 34, because this is where I wanted to get. So in uh, chapter 34, we, we start dealing with some shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel. Uh, and so verse 2, he says, Son of man prophesied against the shepherds of Israel, uh, who are shepherds. Uh, and he says, um, Woe to the shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool, and you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the diseased you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity you have dominated them. This, these are the shepherds. These are people who are supposed to be taking care of the, the flock that God had given them. And this is what they're doing. They've scattered the flock. And verse 8, over and over again, God says, My flock, my flock is a prey. My flock even has become a food for all the beasts. My flock, uh, the, the shepherds should not have fed them on and fed, uh, did not feed my flock. So over and over again, God is talking about my flock. Verse 10, my sheep uh, and my flock again. So we see this, this woe to the shepherds. So this condemnation of the shepherds for not taking care of the flock that God had given them. Uh, if you want to write out here uh, beside verse 4, 1 Peter 5, uh, 3 and 4, and kind of drawing this, this over into the shepherds today, uh, not ruling or uh, uh, lording it over. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, an interesting parallel with that. Um, but verse 11 uh, begins this section, uh, the Lord will restore his flock, the restoration of Israel. Uh, and if you want to write it here, John chapter 10, uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 6, Matthew 18, 12 through 14. Again, a lot of parallels with, with the New Testament. Um, it says, For thus the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he's among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep. The shepherds that were supposed to do it aren't doing it. So what's God going to do? I'm going to step in and I'm going to take care of my sheep and deliver them from all the places which they have scattered them on a cloudy and gloomy day. Uh, I will bring them out from the peoples. Uh, later on in verse 13, I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. Verse 14, I will feed them in the good pasture and their grazing ground. And they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed on rich pasture. Verse 15, I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest. What are you hearing? What are you hearing in this? Are you hearing... Are you hearing Psalm 23, yep, we're hearing that. Um, verse 16, I will seek the lost and bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick, but the fat and the strong I will destroy, I will feed them with judgment. So if you want to draw a line from, from verse 16 over to verse 4, he's saying, he's saying uh, I'm, going to I'm going to do what you weren't doing. Yes, ma'am. These are, these are the leaders of, the, of, uh, of, of Israel. You had the, the elders and the, and the leaders of, of Israel, the, uh, those who were appointed in places of leadership, those who were uh, priests and Levites, those who were supposed to be leading the, 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 the people, they were not. Uh, and so much so that he's saying they were making themselves fat uh, on, on the people, and they were not doing what God, what, uh, God had, did, uh, had told them to do. And so in this case, that's why he's saying in verse 16, uh, so he can look at the sheep. A shepherd comes in and looks at his sheep. He can see the fat ones and he can see the skinny ones that are getting pushed aside that aren't getting the water and not getting the nutrients they're supposed to. He says, I'm going to take the fat ones out of here so that the skinny ones can be nurtured up is basically what he's saying. Um, and so that's what he begins to say uh, to them, taking care of them. Verse 20, 22 says, I will deliver my flock and they will no longer be prey and I will judge between one sheep and another. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. I didn't put it up here. Uh, and so the Lord will judge his flock, uh, and he will judge those who are, are, are pushing those out of the way and not allowing others to eat, and who's going to take the fat ones out of that, out of there and, and deliver them from that, that atmosphere. Then the Lord will shepherd his flock, in verse, beginning of verse 23. Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, 
have spoken. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. He sent Christ to bring the sheep back. So when Christ comes into the scene, the, the religious scene was very much like we see in verse 34 in the, in the time of Ezekiel is what we have. You have fat sheep and you have skinny sheep and you have shepherds who are not shepherding the flock in the time of Christ. And so when Christ is there, he is that good shepherd that's bringing the sheep back. He is the good shepherd who's taking care of the sheep that have been, have been maimed, that have been sick, that are diseased. He's calling people back to repentance. That's what Christ is doing. Uh, and that's, again, that's God. I am in your midst and I will shepherd them. So it's a shepherd. It is, it is Christ doing that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Son of David, yes. Yes, calling Christ, calling Jesus of Nazareth, Son of David, uh, although he was, uh, was more than just uh, a shout out to his lineage, right? Uh, this, was, this was saying so much more. And we're going to get more into that tonight as well. We're going to see some more of that later on. Uh, and so, so yes, so uh, this, my servant David will be prince among them. Uh, and so we'll be seeing more about that later tonight. Uh, and so that, 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 this is what is, is happening. It's, it was familiar then. It's happening in the time of Ezekiel. Christ was calling them out in that time, his time as well. They were not doing what they're supposed to. Even the high priest wasn't the right kind of high priest. Uh, the whole top to bottom was corrupt. And Christ was coming in and calling everybody to task on what they were supposed to be doing. That's why he's presented, like he said, the seven woes, right, in Matthew. That's why he was calling them out. That's why he was calling those and going to those who were sick. That's who he was going to. The sick have need of physician. Anyway, there's a whole sermon there. We don't have time. Uh, we gotta, we got to move on. we got to truck along. So chapter 35, we look at uh, what's going on. Um, did I? Well, anyway, this, again, yes, there's so much. Um, just real quickly before we go to 35, verse 27 uh, then they will know that I am the Lord. So when he's done all these things, this goodness, the goodness of the Lord, then they will know when I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. That's when he's saying, then they will know. So it's not just, so we've been seeing throughout this, this book, the severity of God, right? The, then they will know when this judgment, when desolation, when sword, when beast, when pestilence comes, then they will know that I am the Lord, right? And there are those that learn that way. <laughs> But here in this situation, he's saying, when this good, when I break the yoke of their bondage, when I do these things, then they will know that I am the Lord. And this happens twice, verse 30 as well. Um, and so that, that, that kind of concept is there. So not just the severity, but the goodness. Behold, the goodness and severity of the Lord uh, is a teacher. Verse 31, as for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men and I am your God. Um, this is an awesome concept. Anyway, moving on. So we're going to talk about a mountain real quick. Uh, this is a short verse. I have one header for this, okay? So this is Mount Seir. Uh, this is a prophecy against Edom. To say, uh, if you said Mount Zion, who are you talking about? What, what mountain or what group of people are you talking about? The Jews, right? It's, uh, Jerusalem, Mount Zion. So the same thing for Edom is Mount Seir. That's their Zion, right? That's their, their mountain that they're known for. And so there's this prophecy against Mount Seir, which is obviously a prophecy against Edom, which is what he says in verse 15. Uh, and so he prophesies against them. Verse 5, he says, Because you have had an everlasting enmity and delivered the sons of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity. They were not helping Israel whenever uh, the sieges were coming. You know, they were kind of turning people over to the Babylonians. Like, here, you missed some, uh, you missed a spot. And, and so they weren't, they weren't helping uh, uh, Israel at all. They were in, quite against them. Um, verse 10, he says, Because you have said these two nations and these two lands will be mine and we will possess them. Evil laugh. Uh, that's actually in the subtitle like there. So, uh, so what two nations are they talking about that will be theirs? In verse 10. Judah and Israel, right? So they were two separate nations. And so Edom is saying, hey, they're going to be ours. Well, that's ours now. We're right here on the cusp. 
So everybody's, everybody got shipped out, and we'll move right on in, and, uh, and we'll have these two things. And God says, oh, no, oh, no. Um, and uh, so verse 12, they even said, you know, they're laid waste, they're desolate, they're given to us for food. I said, no, that's not going to happen. Um, and so he, sees, he says, verse, 15, verse 14, as the earth rejoices, I will make you a desolation. Uh, and so he begins to say that they will be a desolation as well. So what I want you to see here in verse 35, we have Mount Seir, right? Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir, verse 2 of chapter 35. Look in verse, or chapter 36. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. So what is, it, what is he doing here? We have mountains over here, desolation, you're not going to have anything, um, your evil laugh got you in trouble, all right? And so over here in verse, or chapter 36, now he's saying, now he's prophesying to uh, the mountains of Israel. So there's this contrast between the two mountains, um, which again, there's, anyway, there's, that's mentioned other places in the, in the, in the New Testament, the two mountains, uh, but we don't have time to get into that. But here are these two mountains, uh, and he says, because the enemy has spoken against you, aha, right, kind of like the evil laugh, aha, it's, even, it's written in here, okay? Uh, the everlasting heights have become our possession. Therefore, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, for good reason you have been made desolate, right? Is God saying to them, oh, you know what, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I got angry, uh, I overreacted. Is that what God's saying here and consorting, concerning their desolation? What does he say? You got what you, for good reason, for good reason, what happened to you is happening to you. Um, he said, for good reason, they made you desolate and crushed you from every side that you would become a possession. Um, verse four, therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. This is the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the ravines, to the valleys, to the desolate wastes. Um, and so he begins to talk to them against all Edom. And he talks about uh, what they're, they're being driven out as prey uh, and in verse 9, for behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you will be cultivated and sown. So uh, there is this kind of idea of a coming back. There will be a return. Um, and talking to the land as though talking to the people, verse 11, I will multiply on you man and beast, and they will increase and be fruitful, and I will increase and cause you to be inhabited as you were formerly and treat you with... Uh, and will treat you better than it uh, at the first. Thus, you will know that I am the Lord. And so, again, this, this future scenario is going to be taking place where they'll come in and inhabit the land. And he's talking to the land, is always talking to Israel uh, and saying that things are going to be better, things will be better. Um, and so uh, he, he makes that and says that about what's happening. Um, uh, in verse 17, So to man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Uh, and so that's why he's saying it'll be better than it was before. Uh, things are going to be better. They're going to take care of the land. They're, gonna, they're not, this is not, can I say this? I better not. But this is not any kind of deal, all right? This is not a, this is not a, well, they were, they were, they didn't do, they didn't take care of the trees and that kind of stuff like they're supposed to. No, he's, he's alluding to the, to the fact that uh, they did not obey his laws, and they did not obey what he, that God had told them to, and the land suffered for it, right? So, and now he's saying they're going to obey, and they'll do better, and the land will be better off for it. Um, uh, and so that's this idea there up to verse, uh, oh, sorry, up to verse 21. Um, now he begins saying uh, that for my name's sake, uh, in verse 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O Israel, that I'm about to act. This returning, this coming back, isn't because you're awesome and because you've repented and, and done so well and learned your lesson so quickly uh, that, that that's not why this is happening. Uh, that's not why this coming back is going to happen. He says, for my name's sake, it's going to happen. Um, in verse 23, it says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord. How do they profane God's name in their midst? What did they do? Do we have time for a list? Probably not, but... Well, idols, all kind of idol worship. Um, you know, we can go back to those chapters and talking about their harlotries and things that they did. Uh, and so all, all those things, they profane God's name. 
and, and amongst the nations. Uh, and so he says, for my name's sake. Um, and let's, it's interesting here in, in verse 24, he says, he begins talking about gathering them. And he says, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Verse 25, he will cleanse. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness uh, and your idols. Verse 26 and 27 is a renewal. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yes, when God talks about repentance and turning back, he talks so much about this concept of removing a heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh. We see that in the New Testament. That's a, a main theme. Uh, we hard-hearted, stiff-necked generation uh, is, as Christ preaches to them at that time. Um, in verse 28, you will live in the land and I will give you your fathers and so you will be my people and I will be your God. This is what God wants to happen. And again, it is not because they are doing so good. In, it's because of God's namesake that this is what's going to happen. He says that several times. Um, if you want to write out uh, here beside verse 31, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. If you want to write out beside verse 31, chapter 16, chapter 16, 60 through 63, uh, he says, then you will remember your evil ways, your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Uh, again, I'm not doing this thing for your sake, declares the Lord. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded of your ways, O house of Israel. Chapter 16, verses 60 through 63, he alludes to their shame, and that, that he will do this good thing amongst them, and they will be shamed for it. Uh, remembering their deeds, remembering what they had done, and could we have done such, a good, uh, such abominations against God? And they will loathe themselves for having done this. Has anybody been there before? Just me? Okay. All right. Uh, so, so, yes, so the, the, the goodness of God, despite where we've been, the goodness of God, uh, we see over and over again in this. Uh, and so we see that here. Uh, verse 36, the nations that are left around about you, because <laughs> he's pretty much getting rid of everybody, <laughs> the nations that are left around about you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. When did they, maybe when they were building a wall, there was an actual, you know, then they understood the people who were, you know, Tobalat and uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, and they were against Nehemiah and against them, and when they built it in 53 days or whatever, and, and, they, and then they recognized that the God was with them. Do you remember that? That's this right here. That's this. God saying, I'm going to rebuild, and I'm going to rebuild in such a way that they will recognize that it's me doing it, not you. It's me doing it. Have you been rebuilt, made new, and people around you said there's something different about you? And you can say, it's God that did it, not me. That is what God is, that's the power of God working in people's, he did it then, he continues to do it now, he'll take rubble, he said, I can do something with that. And people around will glorify God because of what I've done in your life. It's a side note. I didn't, and it's not even in here. But anyway, we gotta, we got to get through here. Um, 37, vision of dry bones. Now, this is what you guys have been waiting for forever, right? Them bones, them bones. All right, so uh, the vision of dry bones uh, we have here uh, in uh, chapter 37. If you want to write out, so here's the vision of dry bones, verses 1 through 14. Uh, if you want to write out here uh, a restored people, that's what this is about. This is a restored people. Uh, and so he's kind of spirited away to this valley, this, vis this vision, uh, and everywhere he sees in this valley is dry bones. How many of you have seen dry bones, like, like chalk dry bones? Have you seen those before out somewhere? Um, it happens, right? They dry up um, in the desert, usually like a cow skull and that kind of stuff, uh, tumbleweed rolling around. So that's, that's, that, that's what we have right here. Human bones, as far as you can see, dry bones. Um, 
and, and he says to him, you're going to prophesy to these bones. Um, and again, he said, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> it's probably not the audience he ever thought he was going to have, right? Uh, Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. And I will put sinews on you and make you, the flesh grow back and cover you with skin and put breath in it. You will live and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied to the bones. And what do the bones do? They came together. They started rattling. This is kind of, looks to be, be fun to see, actually. So they started rattling, coming together, and then they actually had sinew, and they had you know, flesh put on them. Um, but they all came together, but they weren't what yet? Verse 8, they hadn't had life in them. And verse 9, he says, Then prophesy to the breath, prophesy, uh, son of man, say to, breath, say to the breath, obviously not another audience he thought he would ever have, Thus says the Lord God, come uh, from the four winds, O breath, and breathe uh, on these slain. And so this is a restored people. Uh, the vision is explained in verses 11 through 14 about what this is. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Uh, they, it means nothing else. You cannot take these bones to mean anything else. All right? There are people who would like to take these dry bones and make them mean other things. But once the Bible says, this is this and that is that, it is that and that is all it can be. All right? So this is dry bones are the house of Israel. Uh, and so, again, uh, figurative language here. And so they uh, are, are, are brought back. I've opened the graves. I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I'll place you in your own. So that's what he's talking. Verses uh, 15 through 23, if you want to write out here also, so we have this uh, one nation under God. I kind of took that a little bit of liberty there. But um, you want to talk about, so we have a restored people, verses 1 through 14, we have a restored nation, 15 through 23. Why would we want to talk about one nation? Where were they as a nation when they went into captivity? Were all 12 tribes holding hands and singing kumbaya? All 12 tribes. Were they, were they, did they play nice together at the sandbox? No, they didn't, right? They were, they were not. They were separated, separated. And so now he's saying they're going to come back. And when they come back, uh, they're going to be one nation. And they'll be one nation. And so he repairs, repairs, ugh, repairs that breach. And he uses the idea of taking a stick uh, and writing the names on, on, either, on either stick. Uh, uh, and, and, so, and then he puts that stick back together uh, to symbolize that the, they will be one nation again. Uh, and I'll make them one nation, verse 22, in the, in the land, on the mountains of, the, uh, of Israel. And one king will be king for all of them. And they will no longer be two nations and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. And so we have restored people, we have a restored nation, uh, and if you want to talk about the Davidic covenant is remembered, you want to write out here a restored king. Restored king, you say? Yes. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. Uh, my servant David, at the end of verse 25, uh, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, verse 26, and I will be an everlasting covenant with them, or it will be. And I will place on them and multiply them in my sanctuary. My dwelling place uh, also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. What's interesting is that when they come back from captivity, they did not have any kings until like 104, when was it? Yeah, 104 BC. From 104 BC to 37 BC, there was this uh, Hasmodean dynasty that kind of popped up. They were not Davidic. They were not of the tribe of David at all. They were, they were the side upstart kings. So they didn't come back and they didn't have a king. So who was he talking about, this David, who was going to be prince among them? Who was he talking about that this is going to be? Well, um, it's talking about Jesus. If you want to write on here, 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13. Uh, let's turn over to, real quickly uh, to Acts chapter 2. Do you know Acts chapter 2 is a very important chapter in the Bible? A very important chapter. Preachers always go to Acts chapter 2 because it's important. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 29 through 31.
Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. He could almost like point to it, right? This is, this is Peter talking, so he's dead. And so because he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his ascendants on his throne. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. What are we looking ahead to? In chapter uh, 37, verse 24, what are we looking ahead to? Is this talking about a physical Davidic uh, king ruling on a physical throne in this con- Is this what this is talking about? We're looking forward. We're looking forward. Uh, Acts says we're looking forward. Uh, history says we're looking forward because it didn't happen. They didn't have a king. They just had these upstart uh, kings that, that were not accepted. Um, they had guys that came in and said, we're going to be king, uh, but not everybody accepted them. Uh, the Pharisees didn't accept them, and they were fighting against them the whole time. Uh, so uh, anyway, so again, chapter 37 is an extremely important chapter in this book. It deals with the Davidic covenant. Again, that's taken a lot of time out of context. Uh, And so when the Bible says this is what this is, this is what this is, and it could be no other thing, okay? Any thoughts, comments, shout-outs? All right, thank you for your time. We made it again. Thank you.